Alrighty. <laughs> Good morning, y'all. <laughs> oh, man. Hopefully you guys are doing well. Can you hear me okay? Uh, hopefully you all can hear me all right without any issue. As you come on, go ahead and hit that share button. Be sure to invite folk and let them know that we have uh, had a little tef technical difficulty, so had to reboot, but we're back. We back, we back, we back, y'all. Okay. All right, got somebody popped on here. Again, go ahead and share the video uh, so the individuals can get notified that they can come on over and join us. I'll just give a couple of, uh, maybe a minute or so to give individuals an opportunity to join us, to hop on to the broadcast here. Uh, just kind of some, some housekeeping things that I'll cover as we um, give individuals an opportunity to join. Um, of course, if you would like to give, you can give at www.churchonpurpose.org, and uh, it will take you to a place where you can give. So, um, yes, please feel free to do that if you would love like to be a blessing to the ministry, if you believe the ministry has been a blessing to you. Um, as well, joining us online, if you go to live, or excuse me, if you go to notes.churchonpurpose.org, then you will be able to download the notes. You would simply click on the folder that is entitled uh, Family Matters, and once you do, you will see all of the notes there uh, available for not only uh, today, but this past Wednesday, or last week on Wednesday, and last week on the previous Sunday, um, you'll be able to download those notes. Of course, for those who are who came on site this past Wednesday, you actually should have a book, a booklet that has the notes in it there for you. So uh, be sure you have those handy with you right now. And uh, we're going to go ahead and we're going to going to get started. So this is going to be a, a little bit different because I obviously do not have. Uh, the ability to pull up a slideshow and, and show you all of that. So try and follow along as best you can. I will try to uh, remember to make note of when um, I'm actually transitioning kind of to another to the next point. All right. So um, uh, first thing. So, of course, the name of our lesson today is Family Matters When Things Aren't According to Plan, When Things Aren't According to to plan. Uh, I used the analogy of a train derailing uh, just when we were on the previous broadcast trying to get things going. And what I shared was that uh, oftentimes when trains derail, it's because there are some conditions that are not uh, that are that are not conducive to a smooth train ride along the tracks. So when you're when the train is moving along the tracks, typically in optimal conditions, nice sunny weather, not too cold, not too hot, trains moving at a good speed, then the train will meet, will get to its destination without any kind of issue. What happens when, uh, well, things when things go wrong, typically uh, a lot of times what you'll see is you'll see hazardous weather conditions, like there may be a lot of a lot of rain, uh, there may be some some snow, heavy wind conditions, etc., so on and so forth, and so uh, if the conductor is not is not careful and is not aware then what you can have happen is a very catastrophic accident i was using the example of a train that had derailed and crashed in istanbul last year uh, about the summertime of last year and uh the investigation found that what the issue was that it was a lot of rainwater that had swelled around the tracks and caused the train to hydroplane right off of the track and, and it derailed. Unfortunately, there was, there was a loss of life and several, several many others were injured. Uh, but I bring that up because uh, 
ultimately, uh, ultimately, when it comes to kingdom families and marriage um, and uh, dating, if you if you're single and, and you decide to date, ultimately, what happens is that there are various conditions externally and internally that can derail the train that is in this example, in this metaphor, the train that is the kingdom family, the, the train that is God's intention and desire for his children when it comes to the development of, um, of godly character in families, of good, healthy, strong families within the community. And so today what we're going to talk about is what are some of those threats, uh, but also how God plans to and what God's plan is for restoration of families. Okay. Um, so, so yes, you can, uh, expect that we're going to talk a little bit about some things today that are probably, uh, rather uncomfortable. Just, just being honest. (laughs) I know that, um, the, uh, the, uh, the subject matter that we're going to be talking about today, as I was, um, planning to, as I was writing this lesson, constructing this lesson, man, oh man, I was just like, okay, Lord, you're going to, uh, really have to give me like an extra, um, you know, some extra, some extra help because this is a subject that, that is, that is rather touchy. But, um, of course, as I said, we're going to, we're, we're going to make it through y'all. We're going to, we're going to get through it. And, uh, I hope and I pray that it's going to be good for you guys. So as you see there, there in the comments, um, if you go to, if you click on the link or you highlight that link and paste it, maybe in your browser or something, you can see the slides and I'll be controlling them from over there. Okay. And you'll be able to, uh, follow along. So, Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord for that. All right. So uh, our objectives are quite simple. Our objectives are simply to first identify behaviors that contradict God's intention and design for relationships and family. Uh, We'll look at some personal and corporate consequences of those uh, under and we'll understand the biblical grounds for divorce and remarriage. And then lastly, understand God's permission permissions when things aren't according to his design, uh, really incorporating forgiveness and grace there. Uh, And so I want to say from the outset that uh, the objective here today is to give uh, kind of the the guidelines, the parameters for these subjects of um, uh, singleness or when you're single and if you found yourself caught up in, in fornication, if you've ever committed adultery, uh, if you have divorced, the objective is to talk about these things from a biblical perspective. The objective is not to condemn, to judge, or to heap guilt and shame upon any individual who may find themselves in, the, in these situations or have been in them in the past. If you are in Christ, you are forgiven. You have the opportunity to move forward. There's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, as is stated in Romans 8, 1. And so I want to I want to be clear that this is not to try and drudge up or dig up past um, past missteps, past mistakes and past sins. This is simply to talk about it from a biblical perspective, because the chance the uh, probability is that most of us have not really got a thorough uh, understanding of what the Bible says on these things. And so we just simply want to be educated moving forward. OK, so. Our first, our first slide there, if you're there following along on presenting, uh, what I'm going to talk about is what God hates. All right. So one of the things that I think is really important to um, kind of wrap our minds around as believers is this idea and this concept in God's stance towards sin. Right. I think um, it's very popular nowadays in many churches and, and in many Christian circles to downplay not only the weight and the gravity of sin, uh, but also to downplay its effects and how pervasive sin can be in our in in our lives as as people. And so, what I want to do is just really paint the picture and help you all to see, like, okay, these are things that God, in no way, shape, or form, desires. None of these things He intends. None of these things He is quote unquote okay with. Uh, but these are things that God is other than. Okay, God is holy. God is righteous. That means he has no dealings with. He shares no bed with. He has nothing uh, to do with sin. In fact, sin is abhorrent. Sin is detestable to God. Uh, It is that which causes us to be separated from God. Okay, so we're going to talk about talk about talk about what God hates. So God hates sin. First and foremost, I think we all know and understand that. And the, one of the and the main reason why God hates sin is because it corrupts it corrupts the course and nature of things 
that he has designed for his purpose, glory, and kingdom expansion. Okay, so um, it's like if you have a, a car, and as I was watching this, watching this video the other day, it was uh, like, um, like uh, what was it? Car failures or something, what it was called. And in one of the in one segment of the video, it had a, uh, they were they were removing, they were about to change the oil on the vehicle, and the person removed the drain plug for the oil to come out, and water came out of the uh, area where oil is supposed to come out. Now I don't know how much you know about cars, but you do not put water in the uh, what's called the crankcase. You don't put water where oil goes. Um, that's a that's a big no no. <laughs> that's a huge no no. And so, um, it, so and so putting putting water in your motor, putting water where oil goes, we have all kind of catastrophic, all just kind of terrible damaging effects on the car itself. And that's that's what sin is. Sin corrupts. Sin causes things to not function as God intends them to function. And that goes for creation. If you read in Romans chapter eight, uh, I believe like verses 12 to maybe 20, 22, 23, it talks about how nature is subject to sin and how uh, nature waits for redemption by the revealing of the sons of God. Of course, you read throughout all of scripture from the beginning of Genesis all the way through to the New Testament. It talks about, the. you can see and read about the effects of sin from the murder of uh, Abel by his brother Cain to incestuous relationships to uh, murder and hostility. All kinds of things take place as a result of sin. And this is why God hates sin because it corrupts things. It corrupts the intended purpose and um, nature of things that he's created. Now, as it relates to singleness, uh, I'm going to talk to talk to my single folk here for a moment. But as it relates to singleness, and again, we talked about this last week, what singleness is. So, so I won't I won't rehash those there. You can go back and uh, watch those recordings uh, if you, if you like. Um, but when it comes to singleness, sexual immorality is a sin. Okay. Now, sexual immorality uh, biblically is really it contains a, a a broader a broad range of activity. Now, as I'm going to be talking about here today, I'm going to kind of be zeroing in on, on a few of those, on a few of those behaviors. But essentially, when we look at sexual immorality from a, from a biblical perspective, sexual immorality consi is, consists of any kind of activity uh, that would cause us to do something that would be against God's intended design and nature for us sexually as sexual beings. OK, um, and it being outside of the context that God has set up uh, in particular or specifically marriage. So sex, as I talked about on uh, Wednesday and on last Sunday, that the context that God has established for sexual for sexual relations between a man and a woman, one man and one woman that are married uh, is marriage. Right. And so it's within that context that sex glorifies God. But it's when sex is taken out of that context, when sexual relations are taken out of that context, that then it becomes a problem. OK, um, so when we sin with when when uh, as a single, when you commit sin or when you um, uh, engage in sexual immorality, when you engage in fornication, one of the main reasons why and I mentioned this on last Sunday is not simply because guys like don't do that. I don't want you to do that. It's not. It, that's not. It's all. There's always something more that undergirds this concept that I think we miss. That scripture talks about how we are temples of the Holy Spirit in First Corinthians chapter six, right? In First Corinthians chapter six, it talks about how we are temples of the Holy Spirit. That the Holy Spirit, as because of the fact that we have believed in Christ, we put our faith in Him, we now have the Holy Spirit living on the inside of us. When we go out and we commit sins and when we do things that are not pleasing to God, it grieves the Holy Spirit, as I'll talk about uh, here, in, here in just a moment. Uh, but also what happens when we sin sexually, because it's against our own bodies, essentially we violate the very residence or the sacred space that, the, that God inhabits, which is us. Now, I've been uh, reading and studying and going through Leviticus uh, and at the same time been, have been listening to a podcast by uh, a gentleman by the name of Dr. Michael Heiser. And man, you talk about blow, blow my mind. I mean, there's so many things I thought I understood about Leviticus that, uh, wow, just listening to this has, has really been helpful. But uh, suffice it to say, one of the things that he talks about, and I believe I mentioned this um, in one of our previous lessons, 
is that Leviticus really is about the sanctity and the setting aside of what is called, the term that he uses, sacred space. So when you read about the several different sacrifices and offerings that are brought, um, they aren't necessarily, in many cases, especially when you're reading those first few chapters of Leviticus, they aren't for the purging or the cleansing of sin of the individual. Instead, these offerings and these sacrifices are for the preparation of the sacred space or to um, uh, make it so that the uh, so that an Israelite could enter into sacred space and have fellowship and communion with God without them getting struck dead. And this was really serving as an object lesson to the Israelites to teach them that God is holy and that in order to enter his presence, you must be holy. Now, as it's talked about later on in Scripture in the New Testament and Hebrews, these things were never designed to be permanent. These things were never designed uh, to, to be the established way in which man would always relate to God and God would relate with man. And that we have a better sacrifice, we have a better offering, a better high priest in Christ Jesus. Uh, but one of the things that, was just, that really sticks out to me during, this, during, this, during my study, during my reading, is just this idea and this concept of sacred space. That we no longer, we no longer, uh, uh, you know, worship worship in temples, and you know, of course, the tabernacle is is no longer is no longer uh, relevant, no longer around, but the idea and the concept of sacred space still applies. But now, instead of a building being the primary uh, place where we that we consider sacred space, or some instruments that are used within the building, we now are the sacred space. And so when we uh, sin against God, the sacred space is violated. That is, we violate God's word, as you see on here on the slide. We also violate our bodies, which are considered sacred space. And anytime, if you read in Leviticus, whenever there was um, an uh, impropriety or a, out, a transgression against the ritual, ritual system that, was, that God had set up and had given, the children of Israel, there was always some punishment that was associated with it with regards to um, not moral not moral impropriety or moral sin, but just ritual uncleanness and ritual impurity. The individual, you basically had to, to you know, to kind of be, be set aside for a certain amount of days. And in some cases, in other cases, you would just make an offering and things would kind of be, would kind of be reset. But suffice it to say, there was this violation of sacred space God takes very seriously. And this same language, this same kind of concept carries over when we get over into 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Uh, we get into the New Testament that we no longer, uh, God no longer, as Stephen said before he was martyred, God no longer uh, resides in buildings and things made of man's hands, but now he resides within his children. He was, uh, resides within his people. And so this violation of the body uh, is essentially a violation of God's sacred space. And I think this is uh, one of the most underrated things because we tend to emphasize our hearts and our minds belonging to God. But as children of God, adopted, bought with the price uh, with, of Christ's blood, our entire being belongs to God. Our heart, our minds, and our bodies belong to God. The uh, analogy and the example I've used uh, in the past, a long, long time ago, that I reuse is if, um, if you had a vehicle, a brand new car, just picture your favorite dream car, your dream car of all time, and you are super excited about it. Um, and you know, you, you have a friend that would like to borrow your car. You say, okay, yeah, sure, I'll let you borrow my car. Uh, but here are some of the, uh, here are some of the, the guidelines and the stipulations I have for when you drive and at, while you're borrowing my car. Here's some main, here's the maintenance you have to do on the car. Here's things how not to do. Here's how I want you to wash it. You gotta wash it every so often, et cetera, so on and so forth. And you give all of these stipulations to go along with this person borrowing your car. Well, imagine you give this person your car and when you get it back, it scratches all over the paint. The inside's got food everywhere. Um, the, the, uh, the, the car is running, is, is hesitating real bad, is, is, is stuttering a lot, you know, smoke coming out the back when that wasn't happening before. You're going to, you're going to look at your friend like, what, what in the world happened? Why is my car not like it was when I gave it to you? Right? 
And the reason you'd be upset is because one, it's essentially your car first and foremost, and then you entrusted this individual with the car and they did not treat it in accordance with the guidelines and the rules that you gave them. It's essentially the same concept when we talk about our bodies as believers that, <coughs> excuse me, when we, uh, as as believer, if you're single and you engage in fornication, you are essentially violating God's property. You are doing something with what God owns that he would not have you to do with it. So next time uh, you're tempted or next time you uh, start considering engaging in uh, sexually immoral behavior, I want you I want you to stop and think about that. Stop and think, say, my body does not belong to me. My body belongs to the Lord. Thus, I should do with my body that which glorifies God. And this is exactly what's talked about in 1 Corinthians 6, uh, verses uh, like about 18 through 20. Uh, also, um, uh, essentially what happens is we also violate covenant. So I talked about this uh, last week, yeah, yeah, last week and on Wednesday, how when we talk about having a relationship with God, we, are, we have entered into a covenant, and covenant is essentially a relationship. Now, in a relationship, in a covenant relationship, there are contractual agreements and implications that in the event or that uh, as a result of us being in relationship, this is how we are going to conduct ourselves. This is how we're going to act because these are the, the boundaries, the parameters of this covenant. And when you enter into a covenant as a believer with the Lord, you are expected to glorify God in your body. You're expected to live in a way that honors God. You're to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And you're also to love your neighbor as you love yourself. When we violate, when we come, when we act in sexually immoral behavior, that we are essentially violating that covenant because scripture clearly lays out that sexual immorality is not a behavior, is not a habit that believers are to have um, in their lives uh, on, a re- on, a, on, a, on a regular basis or even at all for that matter. Uh, also, it grieves the Holy Spirit. Uh, 1 Corinthians six nineteen talks about, says, glorify God in your body and do not grieve the Holy Spirit. Ephesians four thirty also talks about this very same concept that essentially when we, and I mentioned this on uh, last Sunday as well, that when we engage uh, in sexual immorality, we make God, we make the Holy Spirit an unwilling participant in that sexually immoral behavior. Now, this may this may be um, this may be a rather uh, I'm trying not to be too graphic, but it's like um, it's like forcing it's like forcing somebody to do or watch something or engage in some kind of behavior that you know they detest and that they don't tolerate. You know, um, I'm not, I'm not even going to, I'm not even going to give an example because I just think it would be, (laughs) it would just be way too graphic, but suffice it to say what, when we engage in sexually immoral behavior, we make God, we make his Holy Spirit stand there and participate with us unwillingly in our sinful behavior. Now, you have some of us who can't halfway stand somebody making us go somewhere and attend a particular event. Imagine the Holy Spirit being forced to be present when you are fornicating and when you are committing sexually immoral acts. That's that's essentially what is happening. We make the Holy Spirit, we make God an unwilling participant and witness to that, uh, to that behavior. And that ought not be. And so, uh, what we essentially ought to do, and I talked about this on, uh, this past, on last Sunday, so you should definitely go back and watch that. But what we really should do is depend upon and rely upon the help, the guidance, the leadership, and the strength of the Holy Spirit to help us to overcome temptation. The beautiful thing about Scripture is that Scripture tells us time and time again that God is with us and that as a as a, uh, as a result of him being with us, we have his power, we have his strength available to us, we have his wisdom, we have his leadership to help us to overcome temptation, to escape from temptation, so that we do not fall into this trap or the opportunity to sin. Y'all, y'all there, there's, there's always, always a way out. Always, always a way out. Last night, um, you know, I was, I was, uh, and it, this isn't, you know, any, anything that in, in my life that was like sinful, but 
just I want to kind of give you an example of, of how the Holy Spirit works in these kind of scenarios. So last night I was I was going to head out, and uh, it was about four, it was about almost five thirty, and was just going to head out. wasn't wasn't going to be long, and I was like looking out the window, and I was like, man, it looks real bad out there. The snow hadn't quite piled up uh, so high that I couldn't you know get out the driveway and, and go to where I was going to go where I was going to go. Um, but I said, you know what, let me, let me just, let me just go and see how long this is projected to last because the forecast, you know, it, it changes. And so I go and I look and I pull up KETV live on Facebook and y'all, I lie to you not. I clicked on the, clicked on the live video and the first words I heard out of the meteorologist's mouth were, if you don't have to go out, don't go out, stay home. And I was like, okay, Lord, I hear you loud and clear. <laughs> You know, um, but that like that's just one way in how the Holy Spirit works. The Holy Spirit can help you to overcome or escape from temptation by the recalling of scripture that you've been reading and meditating on. He can uh, help you to overcome temptation by reminding you of something, a close friend or a mentor or uh, someone, you know, who, who is your kind of like your accountability partner, something that they've said in the past. You know, it can be something, something as extemporaneous as, as what I've described. You, you, you turn on the TV or you open a book or, or you, whatever, you, something you see or something, some experience you have just reminds you of the fact that this is not the route that you should go. Right. The Holy Spirit is faithful and consistent to lead you into truth, which means he's not going to lead you to lie. He's not going to lead you into temptation. He's not going to lead you into a place where you would be tempted to sin. When we sin, as talked about in the book of James, we sin because of our own fleshly desires. That's the only reason. That's the only reason we sin. It's not God's fault. And so in moments of temptation, we have to uh, rely upon God to, to, to get us away from those things. And, and in this case, uh, keep you from, from sexual, sexual immorality and fornication. So the uh, next thing that, uh, that God hates is God hates adultery. Okay. So this is for my, for my married folk here. So um, in Matthew chapter five, verses 27 through 28, and I'm just going to take an opportunity uh, to, to read this for you. So I just give me a moment here. I'm pulling up. I got a, another device and all that stuff. I, if I was on a computer, it'd be a little, a little bit easier, but uh, we're, we're going we're gonna to work this out, guys. So um, if, you ha- if you have your Bibles, you can turn over to Matthew chapter 5, and I'm going to read for you um, verses uh, 27 and 28. So uh, what, what these... Uh, what these verses say, they talk about Jesus essentially uh, speaking here. And here's what, here's what it says. He says, you have heard it said, you have heard that it was said, do not commit adultery. But I tell you, everyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Now, here, here is what, here's what Jesus is, is not saying. He is not saying that looking at a woman or a person, another, another person that's not your spouse what he's not saying is that looking at another person that is not your spouse is equal to adultery. The point that Jesus is making here in this in this in this passage is that the looking at someone with the purpose of uh, for sexual for sexual arousal is sexually immoral and is the kind of thing that leads to adultery. That if you're already looking at this person. And considering this person in a way that is sexually immoral, that is for the purpose of sexual arousal or for fantasizing about uh, having sex with this person or engaging in sexual acts with this person, that is the kind of thing that leads to adultery and that you ought not even do that. Right now, why would why would Jesus why would Jesus say this? Well, it's because he knows those in his audience think that, well, if, as long as I don't commit adultery, then I'm good, right? Jesus is saying, look, don't even look at someone for the purpose of being sexually aroused or for fantasy. And see, this is why, and, and probably you've already thought about this as, I, as I'm talking about it, but this is why pornography is a problem. Pornography is not benign. It's not passive. It's not harmless, these kinds of things are intended and designed to stir sexual arousal. 
if you've ever watched um, if you've ever watched the show How to Catch a Predator, right? With Chris Chris Hansen from Dateline NBC. You ever you ever watched the show? Um, you know that uh, oftentimes, if you if you if you've ever read studies or, or heard research, that oftentimes individuals that have graduated to this point of pedophilia, graduated to this place where they are now trying to carry out their desires, it started long before that. Right. It started with going to a to a pornographic site. It started with reading something, watching something that stirred these desires that fed this fleshly appetite. And Jesus says, look, don't even don't even engage those kinds of things because they are the kind of things that lead to adultery. They're the kind of things that lead to sexual impropriety. OK. Also, having sexual relations with someone other than your spouse as a married person is adultery. I think that's that's self-exclamatory. Um that that's yeah, just self-exclamatory. That if you're married and you have sex with someone that's not your spouse, that's considered adultery. That's considered sin. And we're going to talk a little bit about um, the 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 impact of that here <clears throat> in just a moment. <clears throat> Excuse me. So uh, also, what you see there on your slide, uh, on the next slide, we're talking about uh, God hating divorce, right? So uh, let's say that. Um, you have a married couple that is divorced, or excuse me, that is considering divorce, and their reasons for divorce aren't particularly based on uh, the one spouse being being uh, unfaithful, uh, having committed adultery. Um, you know, it doesn't fall within the parameters of the guidelines of other things that I'm going to talk about here in just a moment. But it's for some for some frivolous reason. Well, Scripture actually speaks to speaks to this and give some, um, give some guidance on, uh, exactly how we're, how we're to think about it. So we turn over to Matthew chapter five, verses 31, verse 31. So Jesus says, it was also said, whoever divorces his wife must give her a written notice of divorce. But I tell you, everyone who divorces his wife, except in a case of sexual immorality, causes her to commit adultery and whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Now I'm going to break this down here because, um, if you've ever been divorced, if you know some individuals that have ever been divorced, but, and then have turned around and gotten remarried, you're probably asking the question, okay, so then they're committing adultery. Let's, 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 let's look at the context here. So during this time, it was quite common for men, uh, Israelite men, Jewish men, to divorce their wives for all different types of reasons, for very frivolous, insignificant reasons. It could be something as something as trivial as the wife burned the food when she was cooking dinner, um, or she just no longer is attractive to him. So he would write. So he would divorce her. Right now, here here is here is the thing you have to keep in mind about culture at that time. At this time, women were very vulnerable. Right, if you have a woman. So, so you have a, a young girl who grows up, who becomes a woman. She stays under the care of her father until she's married, right? And it's at the point that she's married that the, uh, uh, the responsibility of care for the woman transfers over to the man, transfers over to the male or to, to her husband, excuse me. So once that responsibility transfers over, the woman is now cared for by her spouse. Well, if he divorces her, then she is now completely alone and vulnerable. There's no one to take care of her, right? So that becomes a societal, that then becomes a societal problem because now you can have this woman who was vulnerable to, um, to, to other, to other men. She may have to, um, you know, subject herself to, to prostitution, which, which was often the case sometimes because the woman does not have anyone to take care of her, right? She does not have someone to be her, be her caretaker or be her provider, because again, during in this cultural setting, and I'm not saying this is right or wrong or this is how it should be today. That's not that's not the point. The point is to simply give you the cultural historical context at that time to kind of help to, to make sense of this passage. The reason a written notice of divorce would be given was so that um, she had she had recourse to be able to go and be taken care of elsewhere. 
Because unless if he just divorced her and sent her away, well, then nobody, nobody, nobody else is going to want to uh, marry her. Nobody else is going to is going to want to take care of her. So this written notice of divorce is is for the protection and for the safety of the woman. It's it's for the betterment of the woman it, because of the uh, the sinful hat or the sinful behavior of divorce. Right. So this is God essentially um, making a concession. And we're going to read a passage here in just a moment that, that I'll break down. That'll, that'll make some more. That'll make some more sense of this. Um, but essentially what Jesus is saying, he's saying, look, y'all want. He said, y'all have heard it said that if someone, um, you know, get divorces their wife and they can go and they can remarry whoever they want or they can have relations with whoever they want. He says, but I'm telling you that if you divorce your wife. Or if you have, if you divorce your wife and you divorce her for a reason other than sexual immorality, you are committing adultery. And here's why. It's because the marriage, the marriage was never truly dissolved in God's sight to begin with. You know, one of the, one of the most interesting things about culture today, uh, when it comes to divorce is that, um, individuals will, will, uh, will go to church in order to uh, get married, right? They'll go before their pastor and they'll do the premarital counseling class and they will, um, you know, do, do, do whatever they need to do to be approved to get married at, at that particular location. But later on down in the marriage, if they start having problems, they'll just go to the court to get divorced. Now, the ironic thing about that is if you went and got married before the Lord and if it was the Lord who was the one who uh, brought you all together, who made this union official, then why is it that then when we, when we start talking about divorce, individuals don't want to go back to the very same place. And I believe it's because individuals know inherently by conscience that divorce is something that doesn't please God and individuals essentially want to circumvent the process of accountability because ultimately what the church should do Ultimately, what the church should do is seek to steer individuals away from the option of divorce. That's what one of the church's responsibility. I was reading uh, one of the books I was reading in pre preparation for this power module was by Dr. Tony Evans. And he talks about kingdom families. He talks about the responsibility of the church to provide counseling to uh, seek to do re reconciliatory ministry between spouses that are having having marital problems that the church should be the place where these kind of civil, because this is essentially what it is, these kind of civil cases are handled before individuals run to the secular courts to get them handled. God has established the church to be an entity and to be a place that at least for believers, where we should be able and have been given the right and the authority to deal with civil issues within our ranks. That we shouldn't be running to the secular court to handle these matters for us. That, but we should handle these things within house first and foremost. Um, so, so yes, that that is why um, that, that that is why God really does not have a uh, positive or con or um, uh, how should I say he does he's not like okay you know well. Uh, sure, yeah, go go ahead and get divorced. I'm I'm all for it. You know, divorce is 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 a is. is a okay with me. God, God is not a okay with divorce, even though we're going to find out here that there are circumstances and situations in which God will permit or allow divorce. It still is something that he does not, um, he does not enjoy. He does not want to see. And the reason for this is we talked about is because, uh, marriage is to reflect the love that Christ has for his church. Therefore, whenever a divorce takes place, that's a negative testament, a negative reflection, not only on that relationship between Christ and the church, but also on God's nature and his love for his people. That if we're to be examples and models and testaments to God's faithfulness to his people, and individuals look at, look at, the, look at marriages between believers, they say, well, what does that then say about the love your God could have, would have for me, right? If I'm an unbeliever, what, 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 what kind of, what does that say if God, what, what does that say about the love God would have for me if I become a believer? Is God going to be fickle with me? Is God going to, you know, uh, not like me or, or, or cast me out because for some frivolous reason, right? See, all of this ties back to the original purpose of marriage, and that is to reflect the nature of God and also to be a model and a, a means by which God expands his kingdom.
So let's move on now to talk about uh, the problem of divorce. Let's go on and talk about the, uh, the problem of divorce. So the problem of divorce is this, is that um, it, nece- it isn't necessarily divorce itself, but that the problem of divorce is a poor understanding of and a low value that's placed on marriage as a whole. So uh, if you hop on over to Matthew uh, chapter 19, we're going to read um, verses 1 through 9 here. So again, that's Matthew chapter 19, verses 1 through 9. It says, When Jesus had finished saying these things, he departed from Galilee and went to the region of Judea across the Jordan. Large crowds followed him, and he healed them, and he, and he healed them there. Some Pharisees approached him to test him. They asked, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife on any grounds? Haven't you read, Jesus replied, that he who created them in the beginning made them male and female. And he, and he also said, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and will be joined to his wife and the two will become one flesh. So, <coughs> pardon me. <coughs> so they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> swallows <coughs> some air wrong or something. <laughs> Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Why then, they asked him, did Moses command to get divorce papers and send her away? He told them, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives because of the hardness of your hearts. But it was not like that from the beginning. And I tell you, Whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. Now, see, this is a bit of an expanded uh, version or not, not a version, but this conversation seems to seems to be an extended, extended version of what we just read in Matthew chapter five. So we go back up. Essentially, you have these um, this group of uh, Pharisees that come to Jesus. And they want to question him with regards to the issue of divorce. He says, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife on any grounds? They're essentially trying to get Jesus caught up in a quandary. They want to try and catch him up, slip him up on his words. But as we know, Jesus is too slick for that. So in uh, verse 4, he says, haven't you read? He replied that he who created them in the beginning created them male and female. And he also said, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and the two will become one flesh. This is a very, very interesting response from Jesus because he doesn't directly answer their question in the way that they would want him to answer the question. They're asking him about the lawful grounds for divorce. And Jesus says, y'all are sitting here worried about and trying to figure out and go tit for tat on grounds upon which you can divorce your divorce your spouse or divorce your wife. He says, but here's the problem. The problem isn't the grounds upon which you can get a divorce. The problem is that you want it, that you're trying to find reasons and excuses to divorce in the first place. He says, haven't you read that when a man and a woman come together, that they are together as one flesh for the rest of their lives? He says, your problem isn't divorce. Your problem is your perspective on marriage. You think marriage is something that you can simply and easily dissolve. That's your problem. So see, Jesus goes back to the core, the root of the issue. He doesn't squabble in this this conversation about divorce. He says, look, Moses only allowed and permitted you. Notice he says here, he says, Moses permitted, not God. Moses permitted you to get divorced. Why? Because of the hardness of your heart. God, God, uh, uh, condescended. God essentially said, you know what? Because you all want to be sinful, because you all want to walk in sin and act sinful in regards to marriage, Divorce will be permitted, but here's going to be the circumstance upon, here's going to be the reason for one, why you can get divorced. And number two, here's what you, here's what you're going to do for that. And see, this is what is called, um, uh, in, in, in modern terms, it's called case law, right? It's this, um, it's these, uh, these these kind of cases, this, this law that is that laws that are written and statutes that are written as a result of something non ideal taking place. Right. Something non ideal is taking place. It's like if, for example, um, you have, let's say, I'm try, trying to think of a, a very, a very simple example that that uh, that would that would correlate and that would make sense. So uh, let's say, for example, you have a, a husband. We'll just stick with a husband and wife. So you have a husband and wife who are married. Right. You have the husband who abuses the wife. 
And then the wife retaliates by destroying some property of his. Then they go, they go, they go to court. They're going to go to, they're going to go to civil court right now. This whole situation is just, is just messy in and of itself. It would have been preferred that one, he never abused her. And that too, that as a result of the abuse, she wouldn't have retaliated against him. So it's kind of, so essentially what's taking place in a, in a, in a, in this scenario is, okay, how can we salvage this situation? How can we minimize the damage done to both parties? So what would essentially be done in that case, the man, he might be charged uh, with domestic assault and the woman, she might be charged with uh, having to, to, to pay some kind of, to pay something to, to, to her spouse or whatever in order to, um, to compensate him for the damage, right? So it's like this whole situation is not ideal. Nobody wants to even be here, but what can we do to salvage this situation and then minimize the damage done. And this is something, y'all, that I think really speaks to the love and the care of con and the care and concern of God for vulnerable individuals. During this time, women were extremely vulnerable if they were not married. They were vulnerable to, to being uh, poor and impoverished. They were vulnerable to, to other men who may, who might pray on them. They were vulnerable to all, to being social pariahs and outcasts. They were vulnerable to, to perhaps never, ever getting married ever again. Right? So they were vulnerable to all kinds of debt, to all kinds of destitution. What God essentially does through Moses is he says, look, if you're going to divorce, you have to give a written notice of divorce. And it's only going to be for on the grounds of sexual immorality. This is to, again, protect the woman. This is to protect the woman because essentially when a, a, a writ of divorce was given, she also had to be given money. She also had to be given money with this certificate of divorce so that she wasn't just put out there alone and thrown on the street, y'all. This is, again, just the, the beauty and the care of God for the vulnerable because certainly... Uh, the Israelite people at this time could have just allowed for divorce, could have just been divorcing left and right, and there would have been no recourse for the woman. But God intervenes and he steps in and he says, no, I'm not going to allow vulnerable this, women to be vulnerable and exploited because of the sin of man. Right. Because of the sin of man. So oftentimes divorce is seen as an easy escape. And this is essentially what I just, just shared that men would divorce their wives for all kinds of frivolous reasons, burning the food, uh, not, not being attractive enough. Maybe she spoke up when she wasn't supposed to speak up. If, if he was having a conversation, all kind of ridiculous, maybe she didn't dress the way he wanted her to dress one day. And he said, I'm divorcing you. God says, you know what? Divorce is not y'all. Y'all not, I'm not going to allow you to use divorce as an easy escape. He says, you are on Jesus says you because you don't understand marriage, because you don't understand and appreciate the value of marriage, if you're going to divorce, you, one, have to do it. It must only be on the ground of sexual immorality. But then number two, uh, you have to give a written notice of divorce. And this, this then, um, uh, is, is reason why, if you read further down in verse 10 of Matthew 19, it says, His disciples said to him, If the relationship of a man with his wife is like this, it's better not to marry. Right? Think about that in light of and in context of what we just read. If this is the purpose and intention that God has for marriage, and if that is the only grounds upon which Jesus has established that one can get a divorce, then they say, well, then you may as well not even get married. You may as well not even get married because they understood the they understood there were complexities in marriage that would oftentimes give them reason or they would want to use as excuse to be divorced. So to my single folk, <laughs> this is why I was saying, don't be in a rush to get married. Don't be in a hurry to be betrothed to someone because when you get married, things change. And when you get married, that commitment is for the rest, for the rest of your life there. Okay. Um, so, uh, so yes, if, um, so move, moving right along, the problem with divorce here also, uh, the low resilience, there's low resiliency and high selfishness in marriage that leads to divorce. That ultimately the problem of divorce uh, doesn't, doesn't, um, isn't, isn't per se, isn't the divorce itself. Yes, divorce, the divorce is a problem, but ultimately it's the reason and the cause and ultimately what leads up to the divorce. That one of the reasons I believe a lot of people get divorced is because 
we uh, we don't we don't do what Scripture says to long to suffer long with one another. We're not willing as spouses to bear one another's burdens uh, in any uh, in any extended fashion. We're not really exercising patience with our spouse, but we want you know all kinds of patience and long suffering to be exercised for us. Now this is a problem because this again does not line up, or this or has as I say this does not um, reflect. God's nature, and it does not reflect accurately Christ's relationship and love for His church. And to to my to my uh, my fellow husbands here, uh, who are also husbands watching this watching this stream, I really stressed on Wednesday the uh, the the necessity and the weight and the uh, uh, the intensity of the commitment that is placed on that is placed on the the husband as the spouse in in that role that. Scripture in Ephesians 5, 22 through 23 devotes twice as many verses to the husband and instruction on how he ought to conduct himself than it does the wife. That the husband is expected to love, to care, to do for the wife more than in terms of uh, the verse content than what the wife is expected to do for the husband. And that's because Christ has done more for the church than the church has done for Christ. That Christ gave himself up for his church. Christ advocates and intercedes on behalf of the church. Christ is there to, Christ instilled power and authority in the church with his word and through his Holy Spirit. Christ has done so much, so much for the church and all that Christ asks of his church is for submission to his will. And so husbands, when husbands do their husbandly duties, they are reflecting all of these things that Christ has done for his church. Now, here's the other thing about divorce. Uh, divorce is essentially abandonment and desertion. Now, I'm going to use a, a metaphor here that, that really um, helps to explain it because this, this metaphor actually uh, gels and lines up very, very nicely with scripture. Uh, but suffice it to say, there is absolutely nothing cordial, gentle, or respectful about divorce. Individuals might say, oh, well, we, you know, we get divorced because of irreconcilable, irreconcilable differences. I'm going to talk, talk about that here in just a moment. But one who decides to divorce or couples that decide to divorce are essentially abandoning their spouse and their commitment that they made to their spouse before God. In the military, if an individual enlist in the military and they are sent to war or sent to battle this individual is expected because they signed this contract and they took this oath they're expected that if they go to war they are going to stay there that that's where they're going to be and that they will die there if that is what is if if that's what it comes to now if an individual in the military decides to desert or go AWOL, then that individual is now subject to court martial. That is, they will face the military courts, they will be tried, and they will be charged and sent to prison. Why? Because they deserted their post. This analogy is the word picture or is the same concept that is talked about in scripture, it's abandonment, it's desertion, it's running away from one's commitment. This is why God hates divorce. Because commitments that are made in his name and before him are to be permanent commitments. The marriage relationship is a permanent covenant relationship that lasts for the entire life of the spouses. And to divorce is to abandon the spouse. Now, we're going to hear in just a second, get into some biblical grounds for divorce. Right? But regardless of whether or not the grounds are biblical or not, it's still considered desertion. It's still considered abandonment. It's still harmful. It's still displeasing to God. It still does damage to the parties involved. So God's desire and intention is that no one, no husband, no wife would ever get divorced, would ever consider divorce. 
but that they would seek to reconcile, they would seek to forgive the, uh, the, the, the offending party, that they would seek to come back together to be husband and wife, to be one flesh, living together, loving one another, reflecting his, reflecting his nature, and expanding his kingdom. I have to say this because when I get into some biblical grounds for divorce, I don't want anybody to say, oh, okay, well then, all right, so I guess that's all I, I that's exactly what I need, the kind of excuse I need to get divorced. No. <laughs> Hear me clearly. God does not, he is not pleased when a husband and a wife get divorced. Regardless of the circumstance, regardless of the reason, God is displeased with divorce and would rather spouses, husbands, and wives stay together, work out their issues, even in the case of infidelity and sexual immorality. That would be God's preference. That would be God's desire and intention to preserve the marriage, not to dissolve the marriage. Because let's be real, y'all. How many times when we were sinners, and even after we were saved, have we been unfaithful to God and God hasn't abandoned or deserted us? God is still faithful to us. Why? Not because of who we are, but because of his commitment that he made to his people. And God places that same onus and responsibility on husbands and wives, that you stay committed to the marriage. That through thick and thin, for better and for worse, for richer or for poor, till death do you part, that you would stay together, that you would love one another in marriage. That no matter how hard it gets, no matter how tough it gets, he's like, if you got to go get counseling, get counseling. If you need, if y'all, if y'all need uh, to go to some conference, y'all need to, to, to pull in a third party, do whatever you got to do to preserve the marriage. But do not, do not get a divorce. Don't pursue divorce. Divorce is literally, should literally, according to scriptures we're going to see here, should be the absolute last option. I mean, it is the last option after you've tried everything else. Divorce is the absolute last option. And then there are circum certain circumstances. So let's hop into this. Um, Y'all have to excuse me. The, um, the slideshow or whatever, it, um, it timed out on me. So I have to get it back up again so that you all will be able to follow along there. So y'all just um, work with me. I'm going to try and work on it here as I'm talking. Um, so biblical, biblical grounds, biblical grounds for divorce. Let's talk about it. Again, only after all of the options have been explored should divorce be pursued in a permissible circumstance. God permits divorce under certain conditions because of, get this, not because he's okay with it, but it's because of the sin and hard-heartedness of people. And that in these situations, he does not permit divorce simply because one is tired of their spouse, as is talked about, alluded to in Matthew 19, which we just read. That God permits divorce only because of sin and hard-heartedness. That's it. It's only because of the sin and hard-heartedness of men that God would permit divorce. And he would permit it for the protection of the uh, violated or offended party. Okay? So, God actually permits divorce as an act of mercy and, again, protection for the offended party. That this individual would not uh, be subjected to or be kept under uh, in an, an oppressive, in a relegative kind of relationship, but it would be one that they would be protected and that they will receive mercy. That to say, okay, this spouse, your spouse here has absolutely no intention of repenting, has absolutely no intention of repairing the marriage or the relationship. Therefore, I'm going to permit you to get a divorce so that you might... You might experience mercy and not have to be subject to this. That's the situation under which God would permit a divorce, right? So in the, in the case of sexual immorality, let's, let's talk about that a little bit. In the case of adultery, essentially when a uh, husband and wife got married and they had sex and they consummated the marriage, they formed a bond to one another. They became one flesh, right? Now, one spouse goes out and commits adultery. They essentially establish a covenant with someone else. There's a rival covenant that is established. Now, there cannot be 
two rival covenants that exist. So what God does, what he allows is he says, okay, this individual has committed sexual immorality. After having gone through the process of trying to get the, the spouse that has gone out and committed adultery to repent, and that the offended spouse would offer forgiveness and that the two would reconcile. If that doesn't happen and the offending party is refusing to do so, refusing to reconcile, then God says divorce is permissible. Okay, so that, that's, that's, that's one ground, biblical ground for divorce. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> divorce is also permitted, <coughs> pardon me, under the uh, falling circumstances, sexual immorality, adultery. Again, a competing covenant is created there. Uh, you also have an unbelieving spouse forsaking the believing spouse in a marriage through sexual immorality or failing to fulfill his or her divinely ordained role. So in 1 Corinthians um, chapter 7, verses 12 through 16, I just want to read these very quickly. So 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Beginning of verse 12, <clears throat> it says, But I do, but I, not the Lord, say to the rest, if any brother has any unbelieving wife and she is willing to live with him, he must not divorce her. Also, if any woman has an unbelieving husband and he is willing to live with her, she must not divorce her husband. For the unbelieving husband is made holy by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is made holy by the husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean, but as it is, they are holy. But if the unbeliever leaves, let him leave. A brother or sister is not bound in such cases. God has called you to live in peace. Wife, for all you know, you might save your husband. Husband, for all you know, you might save your wife. Essentially what he's saying here, he says, is, look, if you were married as uh, unbelievers, let's say you both were unbelievers. This is the context, not a I went and married an unbeliever. That's what's called being unequally yoked. But if you were both married as unbelievers and then one of you became a believer, Paul is essentially saying, don't leave your spouse. Don't divorce them because they're an unbeliever. He says, but stay with them because you being saved, your witness to them may very well cause them to become a believer and also stay together for the sake of the children. Right. Because so that they may have a uh, they may have a, a good example before them. That is a, a mom and a dad together. Right now. What, here's what he says. He says, look, if that unbelieving spouse, however, decides to leave, then they can leave. Because you are not bound in this case to keep them there. <clears throat> OK, so hope, hope that I mean, I, I think that's rather pretty clear, <clears throat> but I'll just repeat it. That he says, if you have an unbelieving spouse, <clears throat> excuse me, that as a result of you becoming saved during the marriage, if they want to leave, they can leave. You're not bound. They're not bound to stay in the marriage because they're not a believer. They're not bound to the same uh, conditions. They're not held to the same conditions that we as believers are held. Therefore, if they so decide to leave, they can leave. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So also the other condition um, for, uh, for what you call, uh, I forgot the word that fast, <laughs> for permission for divorce is what is called spiritual death. <clears throat> now, this one here, I think is a, a very interesting one. Uh, Dr. Tony Evans talks about this in his book. Uh, and, I, and again, I think it's, uh, I think it's very interesting here. Um, all right, so give me just a second trying to find the spot. Okay, all right, we're on that slide there. Got the slides back up. So in 1 Corinthians, again, chapter 7, and if you're going down to verse 39, here's what it says. It says, A wife is bound as long as her husband is living, but if her husband dies, she is free to be married to anyone who anyone she wants, only in the Lord. Now, this is why in the marriage vows, in the traditional marriage vows, it says, uh, till death do us part, right? Because... Once the spouse has, once one spouse has passed away, that marriage is no longer, that marriage no longer exists. That marriage has been, has ended. Therefore, the surviving spouse is free to marry if they so desire. But Paul talks about, he says, look, you don't even, you don't even have to get remarried if you don't want to. He says, in fact, I would encourage you 
to uh, to stay unmarried. <clears throat> for the reasons I talked about in the first lesson, that when you're single, you can focus and devote all of your time to uh, serving the Lord and focusing on the things of God. Okay, so um, uh, in the event that one of your spouse and one spouse passes away, then that marriage ends. Dr. Evans brings up an interesting point, and I, and I, and I think I agree with him here, that he says, um, essentially, in the extreme case that one spouse is determined to not repent or be reconciled, and is unwilling to commit to further to further in the further in the marriage, spiritually speaking, he is dead. Now, here's why. Here's why I say this. And Dr. Evans talks about this in his book. He says, essentially, the husband or the wife has essentially become spiritually dead. That is, he has died in terms of his commitment to the marriage or her commitment to the marriage. He says, I'm not going to be a husband. I'm not going to be a wife. I'm not going to love you. I'm not going to care for you. <clears throat> I'm not going to respect you. I'm not going to trust you. I'm not going to do anything that is expected of me as your spouse. This individual can be pronounced spiritually dead. Now here is, here is where the church comes in <clears throat> because this isn't a, determina a determination that should be made in a vacuum or isolated as the spouse that is about to suffer being divorced. This is a determination that the church should make, particularly in the church or by the pastor or the minister that married the individuals. Because again, the goal is to reconcile the marriage first and foremost. But if it so happens that after several attempts, this spouse would not commit themselves back to the marriage, then going before the church and this individual still continuing in unrepentant, sinful uh, behavior and is continuing to desert the marriage. Because again, this is ultimately what it's about. It's the desertion of the marriage, desertion of responsibility as a husband or the wife. Then under that circumstance, the church would say this individual in this marriage is considered dead. He's dead to the marriage. Therefore, divorce would be permitted on those grounds. But again, this should not be made solely by one individual. This should be made in the context and the environment of accountability with and to the church. Okay. All right. So. Let's talk about what you should do uh, if you're already divorced or if you've experienced divorce. You say, okay, I'm divorced, but now what? All of the things you just said is too late. I'm already divorced, so now what I should do? What should I do? Well, quite simply, if the divorce, and I'm going to kind of give you some, some options here, depending on which situation you are in that it may apply to. If the divorce was on non-biblical grounds, that is, if the divorce took place on grounds, on none of the things that I just described, that is sexual immorality, uh, you know, a spouse has become spiritually dead. If it was, they did not meet that criteria, then here's what you should do. According to scripture, you should remain unmarried or seek to reconcile with that spouse. Unless the other person, of course, then enters into another covenant or another marriage with someone else. And first Corinthians seven verses 10 through 11 talks about this. So let's read it. It says, to the married, I give this command, not I, but the Lord, a wife is not to leave her husband. But if she does leave, she must remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband, and a husband is not to divorce his wife. Right? He says, so look, if you do end up getting divorced, if you do end up getting divorced, then his encouragement is not, his, uh, his, his direction is to the Corinthians to remain unmarried. So that you would not commit adultery, right? Like this is why he says, don't go and get remarried. He says, because you don't want to, you don't want to fall into this, this situation where you end up committing adultery. Now he says, if another person decides, if the one spouse decides to go and enter another covenant, well, then that nullifies the covenant that you have with them. So now you're free to remarry. Okay. Now, if the divorce or separated spouse enter into another covenant, with another person, again, you're free to remarry. If the divorce was on non-biblical grounds, but you can't go back and change what has happened because let's say 
this individual, you, you have no way to get in contact with them uh, or things are just so complicated and, uh, and, and so convoluted that trying to reconcile with this person would, would be virtually impossible, then the only thing you can do at this point, and I believe this applies to many individuals who would um, learn this information after the fact, that if your divorce was on non-biblical grounds, here's the only thing you can do. Repent, try to repair if possible. If you can't repair, then simply move forward and seek to do things in a way that glorify God. Move forward in faith and obedience that in your current marriage, if you are remarried, <clears throat> that you are going to do it right this time. You're going to commit your marriage to the Lord fully. And that if you were divorced and now you're single, I encourage you to remain single. That's the, that's the, the parameters there. So hopefully, hopefully that makes sense. Now I want to talk about something that I think, um, hopefully it'll be very helpful. <clears throat> Scripture doesn't really speak a lot about single parenting, co-parenting or blended families. And that is because culturally at that time, that is not something that you would see much of. You might have a single mother or parent because a spouse died, but it was very, very extremely rare because it was culturally um, unacceptable and culturally looked down upon to be in this kind of single parent, co-parent situation. <clears throat> so what I'm going to say is kind of based on, uh, a study of, of all of scripture and want to kind of give some principles that will hopefully guide, guide you through. <clears throat> if you find yourself, pardon me, <clears throat> if you find yourself in this situation of being a single parent, a co-parent or in a blended family. So first things first, even in a less than ideal situation, God still will work, can work through you that just because you're a single parent or just because you're co-parenting, doesn't mean that God um, can't or won't bless your family. It doesn't mean uh, that God is, has somehow abandoned you and he doesn't want to have any. That, that, that's, that's not the case, okay? That is not the case. God can and still work through those who trust and submit to him, even if it's in a situation that is less than his ideal. So single parenting, let's talk about single parenting. Single parenting is, of course, far from God's ideal paradigm for family. He would prefer to be husband and wife together married. But if you are a single parent, you can still represent and reflect God's kingdom in your home. First off, the encouragement is to be a growing disciple. Okay? Be a growing disciple. The best thing you can do as a single parent is to grow in your walk with the Lord because you essentially are single. Right. So conduct yourself as a godly single would be expected uh, to conduct his or herself. So be a growing disciple, grow in your relationship with the Lord, be involved um, uh, in, in, in godly Christian fellowship. <clears throat> and of course, provide a godly example to your child that you show them what it is to be a godly single person. Also, Disciple your child according to God's standard. That one thing, one, one thing that I think is um, <clears throat> somewhat, somewhat, somewhat of a shame is that uh, parents who uh, have children that can kind of understand and see that, okay, you know, mom and dad aren't together um, or, you know, dad just isn't around for whatever reason or one of the parents passed away is a lack of vulnerability and transparency before the child that you somehow try to pr protect the child from uh, knowing about why you might be a single parent or why their other parent isn't in the picture. I think that, and, and this, and this is, and this is, this, this is my opinion here, <clears throat> but I, but I believe it'll be helpful is that if your child is old enough to see and understand the circumstance of the, of the family there and begins to ask questions, be honest, don't lie to the child, of course, give them information that is child appropriate. You don't go into, you know, a bunch of graphic detail, but essentially explain to them why the home situation is the way it is, but also explain to them what God's intention and desire is. That if you're a single parent and your child sees that 
you and the their their mother and their or father are not together, just be honest with them and say, this isn't um, a situation that that God would desire and intend for us to be in. God would prefer that we're together, but mom and dad are not going to be together. But I want you to know and I want you to understand what God's intention and desire is. And my prayer is for you that if you decide to get married, that if you do grow up and you decide to start having relationships one day, that you then will pursue it in a godly way. Teach them intentionally what God's desire is for family. That it's not single mom, single dad, but it's mom and dad married husband and wife together. Okay? Um, and that also, if you're a single parent and you do desire to be married, that, um, that potentially, if you decide to get married to, and you, of course you get married to a, to a believer, that would be a good godly example to the child. Right? So, you know, things like something as simple as, uh, you know, if you're a single parent and you're dating, you're dating someone else. You know, just being clear with the child that, you know, they see this other person coming around. Like, okay, this person, my mom, you know, my new dad. Explain to them, say, look, this is not your new mom. This is not your new dad. This is, you know, someone that that, that mom is dating or that dad is dating. You know, uh, just just being honest and transparent with the child so that they help. So, so it helps them to reconcile the complexity of their family relationships, but then also incorporating the instruction of what God ultimately desires for family based on scripture. Hopefully, hopefully that helps. Hopefully that makes sense. Now, how would you co-parent? Um, how would you co-parent as a believer? So um, co-parenting, particularly with the other parent being an unbeliever, I understand can be quite a challenge because you're now talking about two competing worldviews. That is, um, the worldview of the unbeliever who cares nothing about the values, who may care nothing about the teachings, who cares nothing about the discipleship of the child, the godly discipleship of the child. So there are competing views there. You may even have differing parent methods. And of course, just the personal feelings between you and the other parent can get in the way and negatively interfere with you raising a, a godly child. So in those circumstances, you're like, okay, what in the world am I supposed, what in the world am I supposed to do? First thing that I encourage you to do, quite simply, be a great godly influence on your child. That if you're in a situation where you and the parent have shared custody and the child goes and spends maybe weekends with mom and then spends, you know, during the week with dad, you want to make sure that when the child is with you, that you are modeling godly behavior before them all the time. All the time. That is in word, in, uh, in deed. You want to show them a godly example. Particularly, you want to show them a godly example in the interaction with the other parent. That is not talking negatively about the other parent in front of the child. Demeaning the other parent in front of the child. But showing them that even, in a, even with regards to those with whom you may have hostility between, you can still exhibit and show grace by the help and the power of the Holy Spirit. Also, um, not airing your, your, you and the other parent, airing your dirty laundry in front of the child. That shows that, again, displays a negative example of how a relationship should be. Constant bickering, constant arguing, constant disagreement, constant unreconciled conflict. And this is where you really have to be prayerful. Prayerful, one, for your child, that in as much as you can do, that you pray the Lord helps the child to grow and understand. That even though this is a situation that mom or dad finds him or herself in, this isn't the ideal situation that God would have for the family. <clears throat> And that mom or that dad is doing the absolute best that they can. So you want to make sure that your interactions before the child with the other parent are, are gracious, are as, as kind as can possibly be, that the child isn't being exposed uh, uh, intentionally to, to the negative, toxic interactions that you and the other parent might have. And then just having an open conversation with the other parent and say, look, you and I, we have our personal issues. But can we agree at least, can we at least agree 
that when we're in front of our child, that we're not going to set a, a bad uh, a bad example for them. That we're not going to argue. We're not going to bicker. We're not going to air our own personal feelings in front of the child. And I and my and my prayer really and and, and, I, and I don't want to give too many like uh, strict strict rules because I believe that uh, each situation can vary in some respect. But the overall the overarching theme and principle that you want to carry throughout this co-parenting relationship is that you want to be a godly influence on your child, but you also want to be a godly influence on that on that on the other parent. That even in your relationship with that other parent, you still are a testament and a testimony of God's nature within you. You still are a witness to the gospel or a witness of the gospel to that individual. So in all of your interactions, keep in mind that even if this person wasn't the other parent of your child, you would still be responsible for walking before them and displaying godly character in front of them so as to be a godly positive witness. So I hope, so I hope that helps. Now, if you have specific questions um, in regards to your own situation, I would, I would encourage you, shoot me a message, send, send, send questions so I can kind of you know, learn and know more about specifically what's going on and, and hopefully we can, we can help there. But that is what you want to carry with you generally through that kind of relationship and that kind of circumstance. Is that, okay, I represent God even in this co-parenting relationship. That I want to be a godly influence even in this relationship. Because just as uh, Paul said in 1 Corinthians, he says, husband, you don't know if you might save your wife. A wife, you don't know if you might save your husband. Granted, you may not be, you are definitely our husband and wife, but you still are in proximity to this person that your witness might, God might use your witness to draw them to himself so that they may become saved. You never, you, you really never know, which is why we have to go through this with the mind of Christ and saying, okay, I'm a kingdom citizen. I'm a believer. I stand on scripture. I'm called to live a godly life. I'm called to live, a, live out a godly example. I'm called to be gracious with my speech. I'm called to speak the truth in love. I'm called to stand, on, stand firm on my principles, stand firm on the word. Let me do these things in this relationship. That's gonna, that, now, and that, that is so broad that it can take all kinds of different forms, but that's the beauty of it. That there's not one particular way that you can glorify God. But you can glorify God in that situation regardless of the particulars of it. Okay, so now let's talk lastly a little bit about blended families. Blended families, of course, can be a challenge uh, if the spouses, the two spouses are not on the same page, right? This, the blended family situation uh, essentially more or less will conform with uh, the principles that we talked about on Wednesday with regards to marriage. So hopefully, first and foremost, if you're in a blended family situation, you're married to another believer. First and foremost, that makes it a war a load a lot easier <laughs> in terms of how you interact right so i'm going to talk assuming that you're in a blended family uh that is you were married before and you may have divorced now or your previous spouse may have passed away and you have children the other spouse is kind of in a similar situation and you all decide to get married and so now your two families become one family okay so um as i've stated before that ultimately what you want to do as a family is submit to God's order and authority and his plan and design for family so that you might be able to experience God's blessing for family. That is that your family might be blessed spiritually and otherwise that you all might experience the kind of uh, spiritual enjoyment and growth. You all might make the kind of kingdom uh, impact on the world that God desires to make through you. The first thing, first and foremost, is that the husband and wife have to be on one accord. Because if you already have children and they're coming from their respective uh, homes, the rules may have been different in the home. So the husband and wife, you all have to come together and be on the same page. That is, just as we talked about on Wednesday, united towards a unified vision and a common goal as a family. Having the same core values, having the same expectations, agreeing on parenting methods, disciplining methods, you all have to be on the same page. Because if you all are on the same page, guess what? The children won't be on the same page. 
the, your children disrespect the, the your husband or your wife, right? They will say, well, you're not, you're not my real daddy. You're not my real mama. Why I got to listen to you, right? But see, if you all are on the same page, it reinforces that this isn't us against them, but it's all of us are together. We are a family now, right? And of course, this can be a process, right? It's not something that will happen overnight because children, depending on what age they're at, you know, they're, they're going to really struggle and wrestle in different ways to reconcile that, okay, this person isn't, rock, isn't my, my actual biological mom or dad. You know, they're maybe my, my, they're my stepdad, my stepmom now. So how should I respect them? What's my relationship with them supposed to be like? And the first thing, the best thing, the thing that's going to help the most for your child is you setting the tone by being in agreement with your spouse. If you're a wife, submitting to your husband. If you're a husband, loving and caring and protecting and caring for your wife and your family. Okay? Also, as I said, having a unified vision for the home and then just consistently modeling God, godly behavior in the home. Consistently showing and displaying before them the kinds of behaviors and attitudes and things that are expected of the family as a whole. Husbands, regardless of whether or not the children uh, listen to every word you say, you are still the head of the house. You are still called to be the covering for the family. Therefore, execute that role with grace, with love, and with truth. And the wife should help the husband in doing that. The husband should affirm the wife, the value of his wife as, as the mother, not put her down, not allow the children to, to talk negatively about her. No, that's, that's my wife. That's your stepmom, whatever. You will respect her. You may not like the situation, but guess what? You're going you're gonna to have to, uh, to, to get in line with this. I know it's difficult. We're going to help you work through it. But this, this is the standard in the house and then working towards uh, modeling and exhibiting that standard consistently in the home. So that's our lesson for today, y'all. I hope, hope y'all, hopefully this has been helpful. Um, hopefully you have, have learned something. Hopefully this has given you some insight. I am going to do a uh, supplemental session, as I talked about. There will be some supplemental lessons that I put together to talk a little bit more uh, about sexuality as it relates to being single. Um, someone had asked the question about uh, masturbation and, and that kind of thing. So I'll be covering topics like that. Um, any other particular questions that you might have in relation to these topics, blended family, co-parents and single parents in your particular situation, whatever it may be, I will be um, taking those questions and I'll also incorporate those as I make those supplemental lessons as well. But um, again, I, ho I really hope this has been helpful. And unfortunately, um, much of what we see in communities today does not uh, model and correlate with God's desire and intention for family. And that's just an unfortunate reality, and that's because of the effects of sin throughout communities and in individuals. We don't live up to God's standard um, consistently, but the hope and the prayer is that through proclaiming and through constantly raising and reminding us as believers of this standard, that it would give us the tools, equip us with the knowledge, uh, and also just encourage us to commit ourselves to the Lord and allow him to use us and work in and through us in such a way that we begin to see that standard raised back again in our families and in our communities. That as believers begin to model as believers begin to model what God's desire and intention is for family, that that example would permeate and influence the community in such a way that we would begin to see more holistic families. That is the whole uh, leaven in the uh, in the leaven in the dough concept. That as we are in the world but not of it, uh, the and people in the world will see our example, want to glorify our Father in heaven, uh, and ultimately be drawn to Him and be in relationship with Him and, and model and expand His kingdom uh, for His glory and for uh, for His praise and for our benefit. So uh, with that being said, you all, I'm going to go ahead and. Um, in this live session, I encourage you to reflect uh, personally, write down what stuck out to you most from the lesson and uh, what you're going to do differently this week based on what you heard. Post a reflection on our uh, on the Facebook page. Let us know what stuck out to you most, what was most helpful, and what you plan to do differently this week based on what you heard. So again, thank you all so much for joining us. We love you and live each day on purpose.